Awesome. Well, my name is Jack Dubinsky. I am the aquarium director here at the Mariah Mitchell Association. And um, this is um, an exciting, um, this is our, I think, third to last um, talk for our winter science speaker series featuring former interns. And we have talks ranging from marine science to astronomy, um, to ecology and uh, many other things. If uh, you have some friends that were interested in seeing the talk and couldn't make it, our recording will be on YouTube. Um, so definitely feel free to uh, share the love. Um, and before I um, introduce Emily, I wanna thank our sponsors, um, which are Bank of America, um, Cisco Brewers, the White Elephant and the 30 meter telescope. Um, so if you guys are interacting with any of those groups, give them a thanks for us for, for sponsoring the event. And without further ado, um, keep it short and sweet. I'm so excited to introduce um, Emily Gagne. Um, I met her in 2018 when we were both interns. Um, she was a museum intern and I was an aquarium intern. Um, and yeah, really, really excited for the talk tonight. Um, Emmy is a third year uh, PhD student studying ecology at um, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State University. Um, and yeah, we're really excited to hear about your work, Emily, and take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Jack. Uh, so hi, everyone. Yeah, I just want to say it's seriously such a joy to be giving this talk for all of you tonight. Like Jack said, I was a natural science intern in 2018, and it was one of my favorite summer jobs of all time, so I'm really pleased to be back. I actually have a specific memory of attending the summer seminar series um, when I was an intern, and I thought it was super amazing that one of the previous interns uh, came back to do a talk on their research, and I just remember being really impressed by the growth that they had um, gone through since being an intern, so... Um, yeah, I guess by my 2018 standards, I am now an independent scientist. So yeah, it's super exciting to give this talk tonight. So today I'm going to be presenting a talk entitled uh, Increasing Scientific Capacity Through Workshopping, Developing Educational Materials to International Participants. So this is a talk about a collaborative project that I'm working on as part of my PhD dissertation. Um, and I listed all of the authors on the bottom here. And I wanted to give a special shout out to Diego Hernandez, uh, who is one of my lab mates. Um, who worked really closely on this project with me. So without further ado, we can get started. So today I'm gonna to be discussing a bioinformatics workshop that both my lab mate Diego and I developed last summer and then delivered at the end of 2021. So this is actually part of an ongoing project that has, incur that has occurred um, in my lab at Penn State. Um, so in the past, the workshops have been in person. One was done in 2017 and another was done in 2019. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we needed to switch to a virtual option because we were unable to travel to Madagascar due to the, pan due to the pandemic. Uh, so we basically wanted to deliver uh, this workshop and we are... Uh, we're, we're really excited to be able to work with people in Madagascar because that's where the majority of us in my lab do our biological research. Um, so shifting into this past year, when talking about the workshop that was conducted in 2021, I wanted to basically give a preview of what today's talk will cover, starting with um, the specific aim of the workshop study. So in 2021, we aimed to design and conduct an effective virtual workshop for adult participants in Madagascar. So here's an overview of how I'm going to move through my talk today. So I will start with some backgrounds, um, both on me as a researcher and then also relevant science concepts to get us all on the same page. And then I'm going to talk about specific objectives that we had during this workshop. I'll then move in to give an overview of the methods that we went through to conduct this workshop, as well as how we are currently analyzing the data that we received from this study. I'll then review the results, of course, that cover the effectiveness of the workshop that we did uh, last fall in 2021. 
And finally, I'll talk about some future analyses that I'm going to be doing, as well as some ideas for future research directions. So let's get started on the background. Um, so I got my bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Maine. And while I was at UMaine, I got to have a variety of teaching and research experience, both in my program and also through external opportunities. So the top picture here shows me holding a really cute owl. Um, and this is while I was interning at the Mariah Mitchell Association. And I had this internship between my junior and senior year of college. And I just wanted to say that this opportunity really enhanced my love for the environment. And it also further fueled my passion for outreach as I got to work in the Natural Science Museum, like Jack mentioned. Um, and then my senior year of college, I did my honors thesis on how climate differences impact heat production in tree shrews um, that live in Borneo. So down here, uh, this is a cute little tree shrew. It's kind of this little, little mammal sitting in the corner here. Um, and ultimately, my experiences in undergrad got me thinking about environmental disturbance. So I began my PhD journey in ecology at Penn State in PJ Perry's lab. So this is where I am now. Uh, and when I started my journey as a graduate student, I was really passionate about investigating how human caused environmental disturbances impact the biology of non-human mammals. So one project that I'm involved in investigates the population demography, history and gene flow patterns in lemurs in Madagascar. Ultimately, what we're doing is we're taking population genetics approaches to determine the original continuity of the lemur populations on the island. And this is all in relation to human disturbance. So the pictures on the right here uh, show me doing some wet lab work uh, where I'm working with some lemur DNA that we ended up sequencing. Um, additionally, I wanted to mention that at Penn State, I started to get a lot more experience with teaching. These experiences for me were both as uh, a head instructor for a course and, and as a teaching assistant. And basically I really became passionate about understanding how we teach topics in biology to undergraduate students and the general public, hence the need for something like workshopping. So because of this, I classify myself as an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary researcher. I sit at the crossroads between evolutionary biology research and then also biology education research. So this is why I am discussing the two because I'm combining the two today to talk about uh, the workshop and how we can teach others information in biology and related fields through workshopping. So before I dive into the workshopping approaches that will be the majority of today's talk, I wanted to quickly cover what these two fields of research are so that all of us are on the same page. So let's start with evolutionary biology. And this will help provide some context to the workshop content that we delivered to participants in Madagascar. So let's start broad. What is evolution? So really broadly speaking, evolution is the process by which organisms um, diversified from each other on our planet. And that created the biodiversity that we know today. So to put it even more simply, as shown on the slide, evolution is the change in heritable traits through time. The key word here is that these traits must be heritable. In other words, these characteristics need to be passed down through generations, um, and this is what makes them heritable. This is very different from acquired traits. So we're not talking about acquired traits. Heritable and acquired traits are starkly different from each other. Basically, acquired traits are ones that we develop through our lifetime. So let's start with an example. Let's say that I run a lot without properly stretching every day. I don't take rest days. I'm not building my endurance properly. Over time, I might get a stress fracture. And if I keep doing this throughout my life over and over again, and I'm not learning how to rest and recover and build endurance safely, I'll likely have many injuries. But these injuries are not something in my genetic code, right? They were something I acquired because of something that I was doing in my life. So my stress fracture or these injuries um, would not be passed down to any biological children. 
uh, which is why there's a little icon here showing that this is not part of my genetic code. Heritable traits, as mentioned, are characteristics that are passed down through a family line and are in our genetic code. So for example, I just threw a couple up here, eye color and height, uh, these are heritable traits. These are heritable traits um, because oftentimes we may resemble individuals in our, in our biological family because those traits were passed down through a family line. So I wanted to give some examples of evolution um, starting with uh, the forces of evolution now that we know what evolution is. So let's consider two specific forces of evolution. I'm not gonna discuss all of them, so we're gonna start with just two. For both of these examples, I'm gonna use coat color in mice as a broad example. Coat color is heritable um, in that genes determine the color that we see, so it's passed down through family lines. So let's say that we have this population of mice um, and all of these are dark in coat color. And let's say that they live in a forest that has a lot of brush covering on the ground so they're able to camouflage really well. Let's say the next generation comes along and a mutation, which is just the change in the genetic sequence, causes some of the mice to be light in color. So um, here we see that the mutation caused a visible trait change. It doesn't always have to do that, but in this case, let's say that it does. Now let's introduce an environmental disturbance. So this is the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. Let's pretend that a fire sweeps, sweeps through the forest floor and it burns all the shrubbery. And this is what they live under to camouflage, as I mentioned. So this is going to leave a very light colored kind of grassy habitat underneath that the mice now live in. So now we know that the dark mice are no longer able to camouflage under the brush. So in future generations, we would then likely see that most of the mice are going to be light in color because they're able to camouflage from those predators in their new habitat. So this is kind of the basis of how natural selection works. Before I move on to gene flow, I wanted to throw up a couple of famous examples of natural selection. Um, even though my hypothetical situation, you have like we have observed similar patterns through time in deer mice, but I wanted to, as kind of fun facts for everyone, share some uh, really famous examples of natural selection. So the first thing I want to highlight is this example with this example with the peppered moth. So. Um, before the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, the black peppered moth, which is the one right here, was really, really rare. So basically, through the Industrial Revolution, a lot of pollution produced soot that became, uh, that, you know, covered all these trees and made them really dark in color. So essentially, because these trees were dark, uh, the dark colored pepper moth was able to blend in a lot better. So this is just like the mouse example that I just walked through. So birds were then more easily able to pick off and identify these light colored moths. Um, so the uh, dark colored moths became more common. Uh, so this is basically, uh, like I said, a really famous example of natural selection that occurred in the 1800s. And of course, we can't talk about natural selection without talking about Darwin's finches. So Darwin discovered that finches in the Galapagos Island islands had various beak shapes um, as shown in the photos. So we have some really large beaks, we have some kind of like hooked shapes, um, some medium sized. And there are basically about 18, I believe it is, species in total that make up Darwin's uh, finches. So essentially what happened here is over time, the species developed different beak shapes based on what food they were eating. So this helped eliminate competition between birds because they weren't going after the same food necessarily. Uh, so some birds were eating seeds, for instance, while others might've been eating insects. So the commonality between all of my examples, including the hypothetical mouse example, is that natural selection influences something called fitness, which is a measure of how well an organism is able to survive and reproduce to pass its genes on. So in the examples here, we would say the peppered moth um, during the time of the industrial revolution, the dark peppered moth had a higher fitness than the lighter colored peppered moth. 
If we move back into our mouse example, I want to highlight something besides natural natural selection. I want to talk about gene flow because this is going to be really important when I'm talking about the workshop stuff. So um, if we return to this mouse example, now let's say we started with two very different populations. Instead of starting with mice that were all dark in color, we are going to start with um, one population that's really dark in color and another population that's really light in color. Um, so let's say that one of the dark mice ventures on over and mates with um, an individual in the light colored uh, mice population. Basically what this does is it introduces the version of a gene or genes that code for that dark coat color. So then in future generations, we might see a mix of coat colors, assuming that there isn't an advantage of one color over the other, like the camouflage example I discussed with a couple of the natural selection examples. So we would maybe see one color become dominant over time if that color did increase evolutionary fitness. I say all of this to bring us up to speed because these two things can come together for my biological research. So both natural selection and gene flow can come together to allow me to ask questions about human disturbance. So essentially I ask questions like, how does human disturbance impact the evolutionary biology of non-human mammals? Okay, so let's return back to the fact that I am an interdisciplinary researcher. Let's explore my other interest, which is biology education research. Um, and again, I am covering both of these because they combine together to motivate why we were doing workshopping in Madagascar. So let's discuss biology education research. So at a very broad stance, biology education research is simply research that examines how teaching styles impact the learning of biological concepts. This can happen at any stage in life. Uh, there are biological or there are biology education researchers that work with uh, young children, uh, anywhere from K through 12. Um, and then there are also researchers like myself who hope to work with an older crowd that are 18 plus, either in college or the general public. And through biology education research, we're able to ask questions um, that are specific to our teaching style. So for example, we could ask a question like, do check-in questions throughout a lecture increase assessment scores? Um, or do hands-on practice questions completed in small groups increase assessment scores? Uh, so these are just a couple examples. But for our workshop, we were curious to know if activities through workshopping increase assessment scores related to bioinformatics and genetics. So some of the educational content that we delivered um, relates back to some of the biology concepts that I was talking about when I was giving my overview of evolution. Okay, so now we're all on the same page and we have our basics covered as to who I am as a researcher. So now we can talk about more specific motivation behind the workshop that my lab mate and I delivered to uh, adult participants in Madagascar in 2021. So something that was really important um, is scientific capacity building. So besides the fact that both evolutionary biology and biology education research are both really cool. Um, our main motivation for delivering this workshop um, focused on evolutionary biology concepts was to build something called scientific capacity. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about background related to scientific capacity. So let's, let's define some terms. Um, so in a very general sense, scientific capacity is the ability to design and then conduct scientific research. So um, this is essential work because as a scientist, I aim to give back to the community that I'm working in. So I mentioned that I'm working on a project that involves uh, studying lemurs in Madagascar. So I'm also passionate about giving back to the people um, who generously allow researchers like myself to use their land to explore scientific properties. Um, so as we return back to scientific capacity, I want to talk about things that countries with high scientific capacity have. So for example, oftentimes countries with high scientific capacity have 
access to scientific instruments. So this is both lab equipment as well as field equipment. It's basically anything you need to conduct a scientific study. Additionally, um, countries with high scientific capacity have novel data and data collection methods. And this is really essential to kind of push the boundaries of science and make really novel discoveries. They also have several trained scientists. Uh, trained scientists are really important because they help mentor our junior scientists. And that's how we kind of keep the ball rolling on scientific capacity development. And then finally, there is lots of published work that comes out of these countries. Uh, in academia, uh, publishing your science is oftentimes a necessity, um, despite the fact that access to do so varies greatly from scientist to scientist. So there, of course, is a level of privilege that comes with being able to publish your work. With that being said, there are gaps in scientific capacity development. So I covered what countries with high scientific capacity development have, um, but not again, not all countries are developing the same. Uh, in fact, there are lots of gaps in scientific capacity development. In general, uh, the wealthier countries in the global north have a really fast scientific development. Uh, in the global south or historically exploited countries have slower scientific capacity development. Um, and this is especially upsetting because a lot of times researchers in the global north are doing research in these historically exploited countries. Um, and the rate at which scientific capacity develops uh, could just be because local scientists in the global south are not giving credit where it is due. Um, there are also other uh, issues to access um, certain science. For example, scientific articles are uh, often behind a paywall. Paywall. So if an individual doesn't want to pay for a scientific article, then they don't have access to that science. So let's talk about filling in the gaps. Uh, so this is why I'm passionate about scientific capacity building and why individuals in my lab wanted to conduct a series of workshops to build some of these aspects that make for really fast scientific capacity development. So basically at the end of the day, we want a scientist to make sure that we are avoiding exploitation of the countries that we do research in and we want to be able to empower those communities to be able to ask their own scientific questions. So ultimately, we want to give them the tools to, uh, to design and conduct their own research. So that brings me to um, the project that I want to talk about today. So again, this brings us to the workshop. And uh, the workshop focused on bioinformatics. And bioinformatics is a great field that can help build scientific capacity. Um, but before I discuss the reasons why, I just want to um, give a quick definition for what bioinformatics is. Um, so I want to give us a little bit of context. So at its very core, bioinformatics is just the science of analyzing genetic code. Um, and it combines topics in evolutionary biology, genetics, and computer science. Ultimately, we can use bioinformatics to answer questions about the forces of evolution that I talked about, uh, including gene flow and natural selection. But how do we sequence the genetic code? So before I move forward, I want to just discuss how this process works. So let's first start with the structure of DNA. So DNA is structured into these two long strands that form a double helix. Uh, if we imagine this as a twisted ladder, on either end of this ladder, we see the phosphate sugar backbones. And in the middle here, what makes the rungs of the ladder are called nucleotides. So these make up the ladder rungs. And there are four main nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And we can also call these things base pairs. Um, and base pairs make up everything in our DNA, including our genes in our DNA that code for certain traits, such as the coat color in mice example, or eye color, what have you. So by studying these base pairs, we can answer those questions about gene flow and natural selection that I alluded to on the previous slide. So we can basically isolate DNA 
uh, from different types of tissue samples like blood or skin or scat, and then send it through a DNA sequencer. Um, I definitely oversimplified the DNA sequencer by having it represented just by this little computer icon, but we're going to pretend that this is the DNA sequencer. So one method of DNA sequencing is called shotgun sequencing. Basically, what's, what this does is it breaks up DNA into a bunch of little pieces, and then each fragment of DNA is sequenced separately. So what happens is you receive your uh, DNA sequencing back, um, and it is in the order of the base pairs or nucleotides, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So again, those are adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine, um, guanine or A, C, T, and G. So then the analysis of that order or of those base pairs is bioinformatics. So that's, that's a little bit of, uh, of a background. So with that being said, there are several reasons for why bioinformatics specifically is a great tool to build scientific capacity in uh, historically exploited countries that typically have slower um, scientific capacity development. So let's dive into some of those reasons. So one, open source data is really growing. Uh, when I say open source data, I'm talking about genomic data that is completely free for anyone to use and analyze. So for example, there is genomic data out there for over 1,100 non-human species. So there are a lot of options. And if you're willing to kind of dig through and make your own uh, uh, methods, then you are, or kind of like, I guess, model your own methods after what other people have done, or perhaps develop your own, depending on where you are as a bioinformatician, uh, you are able to ask your own scientific questions. So additionally, skills can be transferable. So that's a, another reason for why bioinformatics is a great field to help build scientific capacity. So bioinformatics is not academia specific. Uh, lots of industry and technology jobs really value bioinformatics skills. For example, in the modern world, it's really, really great if you know how to code. So bioinformatics can help you learn how to do so. And then additionally, you also don't need a big research facility to conduct bioinformatic research. All you need is access to data, um, some coding skills, and of course, a computer. What I mean is you don't have to rely on a greater scientific infrastructure to conduct your research. Unlike if you want to do something that's really hefty in the lab or in the field, you kind of need to rely on a bigger scientific infrastructure. So how can we build scientific capacity using bioinformatics? Basically, my lab took everything that I've just talked about and we ran with it. And ultimately, we use bioinformatic workshopping to build scientific capacity in Madagascar. So multi-day workshops are a great way to inspire interest in bioinformatics and also provide a crash course in some of the most essential bioinformatic methods. So I mentioned that many people in the Perry Lab at Penn State, including myself, do research in Madagascar. So over the last several years, our lab has prioritized building scientific capacity in Madagascar through workshops. So the Perry Lab ran a bioinformatics and genetics workshop in 2017 and also in 2019 for adult participants. Um, and these happened in person. So we had instructors from our lab fly over and give this workshop in person. Um, and the goal was to build interest in bioinformatics and basically allow participants to develop relevant skills. Uh, and to measure the success of the workshops, participants were given a pre-assessment before the workshop and a post-assessment after the workshop, which contained questions focused on both genetics and bioinformatics. I wanted to briefly show uh, the results from the past two workshops. Um, so I wanted to share a figure from Diego Hernandez's paper that is currently in prep. Again, Diego is a lab mate that worked very closely with me when we developed the 2021 workshop. So I'll show this figure. Um, on the left, we see data from the 2017 workshop. And on the right, we see data from the 2019 workshop. Um, and these are split by pre-assessment and post-assessment. So pre-assessment is on the left in both cases and post-assessment is on the right in both cases. So 
what we're looking at are individual scores on how participants scored on these on these assessments essentially and the thick lines here indicate increase in overall mean um the overall mean is shown with the dark gray line and then we also or they also split um the questions by general genetics concepts and bioinformatics and we see an increase in those scores on average as well. So we see previous workshop success. Um, so I was really excited when I got to join this project this past year. Um, okay, but now we wanna design a workshop and continue the scientific capacity building in 2021 during a pandemic. So how are we gonna do this when travel is limited? This brings me to my more specific uh, research objective than what I put on the first slide. Um, so basically I alluded to this a little bit, but our research objective specifically was to build scientific capacity development in Madagascar but by designing and conducting an effective virtual workshop that increases knowledge in general genetics concepts and bioinformatic data visualization skills. So this was our goal that we had going into this, but because of the pandemic, we had a lot of challenges that we needed to consider. The biggest one <laughs> was the time difference. So they um, are seven or they were seven hours ahead. Um, this was pre uh, spring ahead with daylight savings. So they were seven hours ahead, which is a really, really vast difference. We also wanted to make sure that we had a free software available. Uh, unfortunately, things like Canvas or Blackboard, which are commonly used for workshopping, exist behind a paywall. So we wanted to make sure we had a free software so that it was accessible to any participant who wanted to join. We also knew that the Wi-Fi infrastructure in Madagascar was really weak. We knew that we had variable Wi-Fi instances for different participants. Many people don't have Wi-Fi at home, but if they do, it's not strong enough to uh, stream video or stream uh, Zoom or anything live. And additionally, because of that variable Wi-Fi issue, we knew that we couldn't ask participants to download really large files um, because their Wi-Fi capacity wouldn't be able to handle it. So luckily, we have really, really great um, Malagasy collaborators who are experts in both genetics and bioinformatics. Uh, these two amazing people worked on the 2017 and 2019 project way before I got here. They're great. This is Haritina and Rindra, who are both, like I said, experts in this field. Rindra has his PhD, uh, which focused on population genetics. And then Haritina is currently a graduate student pursuing his uh, PhD. So I'll chat a little bit more about them and their role once I get to the overview of the workshop. But the big takeaway is they helped us overcome some of those challenges that we were thinking about when designing this workshop. So we came up with a series of solutions, um, again, with the help of Heritina and Rindra. The first thing being we needed a free software. We decided to use Google Classroom. Um, and if you are an educator, I really highly recommend this free software. Um, it's great and it really mimics the functionality of Canvas and Blackboard, uh, the other softwares that I mentioned. Uh, again, I highly recommend it. In terms of the variable Wi-Fi situation, we decided to have an asynchronous or in-person option. So if someone did not have Wi-Fi at home, they could go to the local technology hub and get access to Wi-Fi. In general, all participants could complete the hands-on workshop at their own time, however. So if uh, they had um, certain things come up, they had, they had a kind of flexibility in their time that we offered this workshop. In terms of the different time zones, we added an extra day that acted as a buffer. This allowed the instructors, including myself and Diego um, and another lab mate, Anubab, to, who are in a different time zone to have more time to answer the questions that they asked. Um, so if a participant threw up a question in Google Classroom, uh, by adding an extra day, we were able to kind of uh, get back to them and allow them to have time to think about our answer. And then in terms of the downloads, we just went with really small uh, data sizes. So we edited all of our files to be really small. So with all of our solutions in mind, we came up with a plan to run this workshop. So now I'll discuss these methods. Um, first, I wanted to highlight that because this is human subjects research, because they are taking the pre and post assessments, 
we did need approval from the Institutional Review Board or IRB. And this project was considered exempt back in 2017 when um, a lab mate of mine first um, applied for approval. So we went with uh, that approval in order to run the workshop in 2021. So here is the massive overview of how uh, the methods worked for this project. So we started with a lesson design. We then recruited um, all of our adult participants. Uh, we designed the pre-assessments. All the participants went through the workshop. Um, this just happened this past November from the 2nd to the 5th in 2021. After the workshop, they took their post-assessments, which we also developed. And then finally, I ran um, some analyses to measure the success and effectiveness of this virtual workshop. But let's look at each one of these in brief detail, starting with the lesson design. So I already mentioned that we use Google Classroom as an asynchronous platform. So I threw up a screenshot here so that you could see what participants uh, were looking at once they were emailed a link. So they were emailed a link, they were directed to our Google Classroom site, and basically they could see all of the hands-on activities that related to bioinformatics and genetics. Um, and for context, the activities were coding activities, and they use, and all of the coding activities use data from a scientific paper that was published back in 2014, and uh, PJ Perry is my advisor. So this is actually the same data set that was used for the in-person workshops in 2017 and 2019. Um, and it was selected based on the participants' fields of study at the time and their career stage. Um, and for context, the Duffy null allele is just a genetic variant that protects people against malaria. So it's really common in areas of the world that have uh, high malaria exposure, like Africa. Um, so that's that provide just that provides just a little bit of context in terms of what we use to develop the activities. So with that context in mind, we had a few main lessons. So participants began with an introduction to R, which is a coding language. Um, additionally, this introductory lesson covered the basic structure of DNA and basic evolutionary concepts, similar to what I walked through earlier, like when I was talking about DNA terminology, um, like the base pairs and the different types of sequencing, that sort of thing. So essentially, once they were done with this lesson, they had a sense of general genetics concepts and also had their computer system set up to code. So after the intro, um, they moved on to something called FST. Basically, FST is a comparative measurement and it, it exists on a zero to one scale. Um, it compares two populations and an FST of zero uh, means that there's no genetic differentiation between two populations, whereas an FST of one means really high genetic uh, differentiation. So if we think of our mouse example earlier uh, and we thought of how like the populations were split between light and dark, we may see a high FST value um, between those for high genetic differentiation. After FST, uh, they explored uh, principal component analyses, or PCA. PCA ultimately can help identify different levels of ancestry among different individuals. Uh, so it can essentially cluster individuals together based on their ancestry. So uh, these types of outcomes are really useful to identify and group individuals from different populations and ultimately determine you know, backgrounds for each individual. And then we also talked about admixture in the next lesson, uh, which is quite literally just when individuals from uh, two or more previously isolated populations come together and uh, mate or interbreed. So gene flow, which I highlighted in my examples, um, result in admixture. So when that little dark mouse went over to the light mouse population, future generations were admixed is what we would say. So lastly, we wanted to explore genome-wide association studies. Um, and these essentially look for correlations between certain variants in the genetic code and certain traits. So in human studies research, it's really common to look for correlations between some of these variants and a certain disease. 
Uh, so for example, I talked about the different base pairs that make up DNA. You know, we have the A, C, T, G. Let's say that maybe at some position, a majority of the population has a guanine or a G. And then let's say a subpopulation has an adenine or an A. This is just a hypothetical example. We would call this a single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP for short. And some SNPs in genetics correlate to certain traits like diseases. All of these came together and that they had one common goal. We wanted people to be able to focus on data visualization skills so that they can make publication ready figures if they wanted to ask bioinformatic questions in the future for their own work. So uh, that's kind of how it relates back to the scientific capacity development stuff that I was previously talking about. The lesson flow was split up into a few different ways. We had instructional materials, um, which included a pre-recorded Zoom lecture that covered certain topics. I already mentioned there was a lot of variable Wi-Fi. So if people could not watch these, um, they were optional. Uh, we also provided a PDF of slides that had our notes um, underneath each slide. It was it was our script that we that we read from when we were uh, delivering these lectures. We also had activity materials, um, and these are the coding materials that I was talking about. Basically, we provided an R markdown file, and these contain raw code for the participants to simply run. So the participants weren't asked to write code on the first day of workshopping. They were asked to practice with code that we already developed. And we also developed another file called um, an HTML file, which is essentially an answer key. It shows the outputs we got and it shows what they should essentially have when they run our code. So here's an example of a screen grab. Uh, you'll see that in these dark boxes here, this is kind of, this is the raw code. And then in these white boxes here, these are notes explaining what each block of code does. And if you were to press this little play button right here, it runs that code chunk. Okay, and then lastly, we had a discussion board, um, which is where participants could ask lesson specific questions. For recruitment, we had our Malagasy collaborators email the local university, the University of Tana, and also the Habaka Technology Hub listservs. So Habaka um, is where, when, uh, when people in my lab went in person, the event was held at Habaka. And same thing for participants who wanted to go in person this year to get uh, Wi-Fi access, they went to Habaka. But again, they had the option to either go in person or just do the workshop from home. As a quick summary, we had a total of 31 participants register and all of these people were invited to participate, but only 18 ended up participating. Uh, and we think this is because of Wi-Fi variability issues. Um, Maybe they intended to complete the workshop at home, but then maybe they didn't actually have the capacity to do so. Um, so pretty much everyone ended up going in person to Habaka. Uh, most of the participants were grad students, um, and I wanted to just highlight that. And unfortunately, we didn't have the sample size. Um, we didn't have a high enough sample size for individuals who did this completely at home to make comparisons between the success of people who went and worked in Habaka with our Malagasy instructors um, versus those who stayed home and did it themselves. So then we designed the uh, pre-assessments. Um, the pre-assessments and the post-assessments were both written in English and French. Um, so that uh, we could increase accessibility. Um, and so basically the way we did this is we had a bank of 40 questions, which were bioinformatics and general genetics questions. Um, and each one was personalized. So we had 20 random questions as the pre-assessment and the other 20 as the post-assessment. And this is also where they gave consent to be part of the research. But the randomization is really important. So we had a bank of 40 questions 20 random questions were pulled for the pre-assessment and the remaining 20 questions, again, were uh, left for the post-assessment. But we did this um, randomization for every single participant. And this was really important because if we were to give the same questions from pre to post, these are graduate students, they will probably remember the questions and then they'll probably be able to get 100 on the post-assessment. So we wanted to essentially avoid that by doing this randomization. After they took their pre-assessment, they went through the workshop and then they took their post-assessment. And then finally, uh, I graded everything and did an analysis, which I will show you right now. 
So the first thing that I did was I graded the assessments in a few different ways. First, I attained overall scores, um, which was just their overall score for the pre-assessment and the post-assessment. And then I split the scores for bioinformatics questions and genetics questions. So they had three scores total, one overall, one bioinformatics, and one genetics. I then ran a normality test to see if the data was uh, normally uh, distributed. And then finally, I ran a pair t-test to see if there was a significant difference between the average of the pre-assessment and the post-assessment. And I did this three times uh, for each score, overall bioinformatics and finally genetics. So now I can dive into the results that we saw in the 2021 workshop. So here we see the overall results, meaning the overall grade that they received on their pre and post um, assessment. So these are box plots. So the center line here in each box uh, represents the median. And these scores are proportions, hence the decimal. Um, and then the mean are these red dots here. So we did see a significant difference in mean. So the post-assessment scores were higher than those of the pre-assessment. So that was really exciting because this is the first time we have ever done a virtual workshop or attempted anything like it. I also wanted to provide a figure similar to what Diego put together that I showed in the beginning where we see the pre and post assessment scores for each individual. So every line here is a participant score. Um, and the dark blue line here shows the average. And we see a trend that many or most um, individuals increase their score from pre assessment to post assessment. I did the same thing for the genetics results. So I analyzed them in the same way. And here we see a box plot set up the exact same way. So again, these lines in the center represent median and then the red dot represents mean. Um, and we did see a significant difference in mean between the two, again, with the post assessment score being higher. So really exciting. I wanted to throw up another figure to show that again, the majority of participants increased their scores. So we saw this trend uh, for the genetics results as well. And again, the dark blue line here is the average. And then lastly, uh, the analysis was done for the bioinformatics results. Um, same type of figure. So we see the box plot here, the line in the center is the median, the red dot is the mean, and we did see a significant increase here as well. So that was really exciting. And we saw the same trend with the majority of participants doing better on the post-assessment. So overall, we were really excited. So like I said, we observed a significant increase in mean score for all three categories, overall genetics and bioinformatics. And this was great because this indicates overall knowledge growth. So this suggests to us that virtual workshops can be sufficient ways to build scientific capacity related to bioinformatics. This is great because this means in the future, um, this would be a lot cheaper to, uh, kind of initiate something like this and other historically exploited countries. But in general, I wanted to have sort of the big take home message that I really wanna emphasize, which is whenever we are doing research in other countries, we should be really mindful of their scientific capacity development. I'm not saying that every scientist who studies a specific organism in a specific place needs to conduct a workshop in order to increase scientific capacity development. Um, but I do encourage all scientists to grant authorship on their published work when appropriate. Oftentimes, these local scientists are the reason for the research success. So it's important that they're on the publication, and it's important that they're given a copy of the scientific manuscript once it's out. So that's kind of my bigger take home message. And I'll briefly talk about some future work that I'm going to do. I have some immediate next steps that I'm going to tackle, including separating the questions by module um, and seeing the success on each individual question on the pre-assessments and the post-assessments. This is important because if we were to do something like this again, we'd want to adjust the material in the future for low scoring questions. So let's say a specific question was wrong across the board. It most likely means that we did not do our best um, in teaching that and we'd want to enhance our material, our materials instead of throwing the question away. Additionally, we want to make sure that we expand uh, accessibility when this paper is published, uh, we are also going to publish the materials that we used in Google Classroom so other people can use these as bioinformatic trainings, which uh, is really exciting and will increase increase accessibility across the board. 
Um, I also am interested to see the differences between the different workshop years. So was this workshop as successful as the in-person workshops? Um, I plan to do an analysis to kind of figure out whether the virtual aspect made a huge difference for these workshops. And then finally, we're interested in long-term retention. So if we were to do another workshop like this, uh, it would be really interesting and great if we could get some of the participants willing to take another post assessment six months to a year later to see if they were able to retain some of the technical information that uh, they learned throughout our workshop. Um, additionally, if we were to do this again, we would administer uh, attitude surveys. Um, and attitude surveys are really interesting as a um, biology education researcher. They allow us to kind of quite literally measure the attitudes that people have towards certain subjects. So for example, um, this is just an example that I made up, but an attitude survey might give you a statement and then it might ask a participant to indicate how much or how little they agree with that statement on a sliding scale. So for example, bioinformatics is very difficult. They would, they would indicate whether they strongly disagree or strongly agree on a sliding scale. Uh, same thing, bioinformatics is intimidating. I am someone who would excel at bioinformatics. It'd be really interesting to see how, um, how the participants' attitudes change after taking the workshop. Does it seem like it would be more accessible to them? Um, that's something that I would definitely be interested in. So that brings me to my acknowledgements. I'd really like to thank my advisor, PJ Perry, for inviting me onto this really exciting project um, and everyone in the Perry Lab for being uh, super supportive. Uh, Habaka Innovation Hub and all of our Malagasy collaborators, they were amazing. Diego Hernandez, of course, who developed this workshop with me, um, as well as a previous graduate student in our lab, Richard, who uh, ran the 2017 workshop. Uh, and lastly, uh, the... Uh, National Science Foundation funded this work. So that's that's kind of everything from me. And that brings us to questions. Um, and I put my email up here as well in case anyone wants to continue having a conversation in the future. Um, and again, I really wanna thank the Mariah Mitchell Association for having me and thank you all for being here. Awesome, thanks so it. much, Emmy. <laughs> um, let me just get my video back up. Um, Great. So um, like I mentioned before, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stick them in the Q&A and we will answer them live. Um, <laughs> so yeah, go for it. Um, but in the meantime, um, Emily, I have some questions for you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, did, did you find that the participation and like interest in doing the workshop increased or decreased as a result of the pandemic or oh. virtual? Great question. For me or for the participants? Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, I, I was just wondering like how many people attended like pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Yeah, so pre-pandemic, this was in person and we, uh, in 2017 and 2019, there was also a bucket of funding that allowed uh, certain participants to travel to the workshop. So in the past, it was actually very competitive to get into the workshop. Um, I believe in 2019, they had uh, almost like 100 applicants and only 30 were selected. Whereas this time, um, it was difficult kind of uh, getting participants because of COVID to uh, want to participate because if they weren't comfortable going in person and didn't have a good Wi-Fi situation at home, it really made it impossible for them to do the workshop. Um, so the participants that we did have were really excited and really collaborative with one another, which was really excellent to see. But um, yeah, there were there were definitely really strong barriers that made it difficult because of the pandemic. Yeah, um, yeah. I was also wondering. Um, you, you had mentioned that most of the participants were grad students. Are they? I was just wondering, like, are the common trajectories of the participants, you know, in bioinformatics and genetics, or did some folks just come from other fields and just take it for fun? Yeah, so um, it was really split across the board. We asked them the fields um, that they were from, like not everyone was a graduate student. We had a high school teacher, for instance, some people worked in industry, which was really great. Um, but in general, the academics were focused on uh, topics in evolution, like uh, uh, biological anthropology, that was a really common one. Um, basically, the ties that our Malagasy collaborators had through their own programs. I feel like that's where we saw kind of the biggest turnout this year. 
Um, but yeah, they were, they, we had people who were beginners and then we had people who had experience in bioinformatics, but even if they weren't interested in going into bioinformatics specifically, they knew that they needed to code in order to do their dissertation analysis. So that's why they ended up taking it. But we did have people take it for general interest, um, which was really great and really exciting because that means, you know, that they, they really want to be there. And yeah, it was cool. Awesome. Um, all right. Yeah. If, uh, if the, yeah, if you attendees have any uh, questions, yeah, stick them in the Q and A. Um, <laughs> otherwise I got two more for you. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, so I was wondering, so when you were doing the analysis of the, you know, um, increase of scores, yes. was there like a certain threshold that you decided was going to be like successful? Like, you know, oh, mm -hmm. if they had increased this 10%, that's great. Uh, or you like had like a certain goal for like the increase from the um, pre yeah. post assessment? Well, because we had never done a virtual workshop, all we really wanted was that significant p-value. <laughs> <So, laughs> We didn't have any huge goals in terms of, I really hope it goes from 50% to 90%. It was more of, is this a significant increase across the board? Um, and I do want to address that we saw a couple of participants have scores that lowered from pre-assessment to post-assessment because we did that randomization. So that's kind of why the randomization is really important because if we had super, super hard questions and they all just happen to land on the post-assessment, then it might be likely that a graduate student who's had some exposure to, you know, genetics and evolutionary biology to be able to answer really well on the easy questions, but then struggle on those more difficult questions. So no, in short, I guess we didn't really have a goal when I was going through and grading them. I do know that anytime that there is a decrease, I was definitely like holding my breath being like, <laughs> okay, like I, I hope overall we saw this significant increase and we did. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, my last question for you was, um, I was wondering if you got like general feedback from the participants and what they thought the strengths and weaknesses of the workshop overall were. Yeah. So we actually didn't have any sort of formal survey. We just were able to chat on our discussion board, um, like after the fact. So it was just kind of general feedback in the future. That's kind of, uh, like what I was alluding to when I was talking about like the attitude surveys, I would really like to see how the workshop increased or decreased their interest. A main reason, we could have done general feedback just for our own interest, which I think we definitely should have done. But a big reason for why we kind of stuck to our general design was because we had that IRB approval from 2017. So we were only allowed to ask certain types of questions. We didn't necessarily have approval to do attitude survey questions for publication, not for general interest. But yeah, if I could go back, I would definitely be like, hey, here's a, you know, quick Google poll that you can fill out. Um, we were more just fingers crossed, hoping that they would complete the post assessment because we did have uh, not everyone who finished the workshop ended up taking the post assessment. So it was kind of like one more thing we were going to have to ask for from participants from afar. So we were just kind of trying to get our data back. But in the future, definitely, definitely we'll do both attitude surveys and informal feedback surveys. Great. Um, I think that was all of my questions. Um, and I, it doesn't look like we have um, any in the Q&A, which means you probably did an amazing job of answering <laughs> people's questions uh, throughout the talk. Um, so I think we'll uh, wrap it up. Um, Emily, thanks so much for talking with us. I was so happy to hear about your work and how great you're doing. And um, for those of you uh, still um, listening, um, definitely come back um, in two weeks time. Um, our next speaker is Julia Blythe, who will be talking about her work at the MMA um, um, and she is our biological collections manager, and that should be really fun too. And um, and like I mentioned before, if uh, you know anyone that was interested in this talk and couldn't make it, um, we will post it on our YouTube page. We have a special playlist um, for the science winter science speaker series, so um, you can watch this talk and um, our previous talks as well. And uh, yeah, Emily, thanks so much again for coming and yeah, chatting with you. us. And um, yeah, I had a blast and. Um, yeah, have a fabulous rest of your day. Thanks, you too. It was nice to see you virtually. <laughs> All righty. Thanks, Hopefully everyone, for joining. Back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let me know if you're visiting Nantucket. If I'm visiting Nantucket, I will hit you up. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. See ya. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.